in some ways the most interesting demonstration for me of the ways in which these are not separable, this thought from emotion stuff, is this really interesting domain of how the human brain does metaphor. Okay, so we get to symbols, we get to abstract things, we get into a world where we have a legal system where not only can we judge that somebody has done something wrong to somebody else if they have murdered them or stolen their possessions, but they can be viewed as having done something transgressive if they've ruined the reputation of somebody else, if they've stolen the ideas of somebody else, plagiarism. This is a very abstract world of judgments we have. These are very symbolic realms of decision making we are often into. Yet, we have this problem that we have this very old evolutionary brain that did not necessarily evolve for doing symbols and metaphors. And one of the things you wind up seeing is when the brain evolved the ability to do some of this more metaphorical stuff, it had to make use of the old circuitry that was there. And thus what you wind up seeing is very often when dealing with extremely abstract issues of decision making, we treat some of the metaphorical components as if they were absolutely real. What would be an example of this? Here's one very cool study that was done recently. Okay, so your body and your brain is very wired up for doing temperature regulation. Ooh, this is hot, this is cold, these are different temperatures, there's a whole like metric and temperature sensitive receptors and there's a whole circuitry thing. And it's going about the very physical task in the very real world of telling something about temperature oscillation of ions or whatever. Get a hold of this study. Somebody is coming up for what they believe is some sort of psych testing that they have volunteered for. They get in the elevator to go up and the actual experiment is started in the elevator. Somebody working on the experiment comes in and they're holding a whole bunch of books and barely holding on to them and they're having a cup of something and they ask the person, can you do me a favor, I'm about to drop this, could you just hold this cup until we get up to the fourth floor? In one case, the cup is iced tea, the cup is cold. In the other case, the cup is warm tea. Warm. So the person spends about 15 seconds holding either this cold cup or this hot cup, and the person thanks them afterward, and out they go. And then they are asked to evaluate the personality of the person they just interacted with in the elevator and hold the warm cup, and you rate the person as having a warmer, more expressive personality. What? No, no, no. Temperature, we're talking about like how fast molecules are oscillating. That's what temperature is. Warmth, that's just a metaphor. They get intermixed. When brains had to invent dealing with things like how warm of a personality somebody has, or even something as nutty as how warm is the color of the carpeting in this room, where are you going to stuff it? In some way, it is hijacking some of the far more literal pathways of storage information in the brain. Another example, here is a wonderful one. We already know that the same part of the brain, the anterior cingulate, that will tell you that your finger was just poked is telling you that somebody else's finger was poked. You are feeling their pain in the same part of the brain that is doing pain in a literal sort of way. Another case of the brain kind of mixing metaphor and symbol with the real thing. Here's a particularly interesting version. Go get yourself exposed to some totally rotting, smelly carcass or inadvertently take a bite into some truly rotten food and you will have an area of the brain activate called the insular cortex. And what that does, and every species looked at, is it processes foul, disgusting stimuli. Disgusting, spoiled food, a rotten smell, all of that. That's what the insular cortex does. And, you know, no doubt there's tongue receptors telling you bacterial loads or acidity of this rotten food or some such thing. And that's what this part of the brain does. Now, sit down a person and tell them a story of somebody being totally, totally mistreated by somebody powerful in some completely exploited of horrible circumstance and the insular cortex will activate. Have somebody play some game with somebody else, one of the prisoner's dilemma type games, where the person totally stabs them in the back, the person they're playing against, and gets away with it and makes some really exploited, rotten gesture, and the insular cortex activates. Sit somebody down and say in the control group, tell me about some event that happened when you were growing up, versus the experimental group, tell me about a time when you were growing up that you did something really awful to somebody else. 
and the person describes that circumstance and the insular cortex activates. What does this part of the brain do? It's saying, oh yes, this food is full of maggots and does not taste very well, but it also does moral disgust. When you are feeling disgusted with how someone has been treated, when how you've been treated, it activates. When you are having moral self-disgust, recounting something awful you did to somebody, this part of the brain activates. My God, don't they realize up there this is a metaphor? You're not really eating rotten food. And every language on earth has words referring to moral failures with words denoting gustatory repellent stimuli. I am disgusted by what you did. The fact that they did this, when I hear about what they did, it makes me nauseous. Something about this smells rotten. Every culture has terms that intermixes literal sensory disgust with moral disgust. And what that's telling you is that when humans came up with something as fancy as moral transgressions, where are you going to stick the sense of outrage you feel when there is a moral transgression? I know. Let's hijack the part of the brain that tells you you're eating some rotten food shoehorning into there. Now what you see is it is possible for us to begin to confuse on which level those areas are working. Another study, amazing one, a couple of years ago. Here's what was done in the study. You take people and you put them through their paces of either telling me something wonderful you did when you were a kid, something neutral, or some moral transgression you once had. Tell me all about it. And then afterward, saying, well, thanks for participating in this. And tell you what, um, you know, we, we can't pay you, but we can either give you this pen set, or we can give you this nice flash drive, or we can give you this little soap set of scented soaps or whatever and have people talk about their moral failings and they're more likely to choose the soap afterward. People want to wash their hands of their sins and starting with Pilate washing his hands of whatever, this is an intermixing of metaphor with reality showing how clearly this was the case. Now what they next did in the study was had people wallow in recounting something awful they had done to somebody else and then they were allowed to go to the bathroom and I don't quite remember how they did this if they had cameras in the bathroom which I kind of suspect they didn't but, or if they weighed the soap afterward or something but people who had just gone through the moral transgression recounting were much more likely to go in the bathroom and wash their hands at that point but now what they had were people who had done the moral transgression recounting I Either they were given the opportunity to wash their hands afterward of it, or they were not given the opportunity. Now, sitting in the test room, what happens is the staged thing. One of the people working on the project comes in holding a whole bunch of books and accidentally drops them and a bunch of pencils scattered all over the floor. If you were allowed to wash your hands of your metaphorical sins in the previous few minutes, what they showed was you were less likely to jump up and help the person. People translating a sense of being morally soiled into being an imperative of helping somebody else. Let somebody go wash their hands of recounting the awful thing they did to somebody else and they're less likely to help people afterward. What I think we're seeing here is this amazing intertwining of us doing some of our most abstract judgments and decision makings and decisions about behaviors or not where we just got these old ancient mammalian brains that does rotten food, doesn't do rotten ethics, you've got the systems confused. What this begins to speak to is work by a very prominent person in the field, a guy, University of Virginia, Jonathan Haidt, whose work emphasizes just how much moral decision making is not decision making, how much it is affective decisions. Showing first with brain imaging how often you are getting the affective, the limbic, the disgusted cortical levels of response before you have the decision making, argument being, and there, it is affect driving the decision making rather than the other way around. But what he also points out is the frequency you give people scenarios, and he's done really interesting work with this, where you give somebody a scenario where 
it just strikes you as wrong. Here are two of the ones that he hears, three of the ones that he uses very often in the studies. First one, you describe a pair of siblings. They are grown up and they are post-reproductive. Uh, she has gone through menopause, he's had a vasectomy, whatever, and they are in love and not in the platonic sibling way, and they want to have a sexual incestuous relationship. Is it okay for them to do it completely in private? Second scenario, your elderly grandmother says it is absolutely fine with her to slap her in the face right now. Do you feel like it is okay to do? Third scenario, one that he brings up, having to do with burning a flag and stomping on it, something laden with symbolism, but at the end of the day is nothing more than just some cloth. Another one he brings up is, you're hungry, your pet has just died, why not cut him up and eat him? And in all these cases, what you have is exactly the responses all of you just had in there, and these insular cortical neurons are popping out of people's ears all over this room. And then what he does is say, well, what's wrong with that? And people really have a hard time giving a rational explanation. This whole framework that he has developed, which most of the imaging research agrees with, that people make their affective decisions long before their more cognitive ones. The cognitive ones are catching up afterward, trying to figure out, well, why is it so important that you cannot step on some cloth that has this pattern on it, but it's okay to step on cloth with it? Why is that something worth putting in people in jail for? it just doesn't feel right. And I think what that has much to do with is how much of the coding of the abstract stuff has to be stuffed into ancient brain pathways that's telling you about very cold things instead of cold personalities, very disgusting foods rather than disgusting moral acts. We are dealing with a very ancient brain and one that's not very good yet at separating sort of a limbic world from a more cortical one.